Well, so excited today. Uh, this is the beginning of Cerebellum Week. Uh, the cerebellum, uh, often called the Rodney Dangerfield part of the brain, it just gets no respect. Mm -hmm. And to help me with this week is Winfred Nord. Thank Welcome. Hi. Uh, Winfred is from England, and I've known of his work for, goodness, I think, 15 or 20 years uh, when you came out with a program that was really directed to optimize yeah. cerebellar function, which then helped to optimize learning and kids who had ADD and yeah. autism. Yeah. And I learned about you through my friend, Ned Hollowell, mm. who was doing your work he was, that's right. in the clinics. But you're actually not a doctor or psychologist. No. You're a business person. No, I'm a so dad. I'm a dad. You're a dad. So how did you fall in love with the cerebellum? Now, before you answer that question, let me just get this, because I know a lot of people are listening to the podcast. The cerebellum is 10% of the brain's volume. Yeah. It's at the back bottom part of the brain. Cerebellum actually means little brain. Mm. And even though it's 10% of the brain's volume, it contains half, 50% yeah. of the brain's neurons yeah. or nerve cells. And it is wildly important and wildly connected yeah. to other parts of the brain, especially yeah. the front part. Yeah. of the brain. So uh, why did you fall in love with the cerebellum? <laughs> I, I, I fell in love with it because, uh, yes, I, I was a business, I guess I am a businessman, but my daughter struggled so badly with learning at school and the experts were all saying she's got to learn to live with her problems, she's not going to read, she's not going to write, she's not maybe going to make that many friends and so on. And she finally attempted to take her life. Oh. Heartbreaking. And she was how and old that, when that happened? She was in her late teens. That to me was a huge wake up call because when you're a dad, you know, I'd, I'd got all the best things in life. I'd got a plane and a boat and all oh, lovely house and I'd got everything. No one saw the fact that I'd got a daughter that I loved dearly that just didn't want to be around. And all of the best help we could get then just was not able to turn it into someone that could learn. We could actually see that there was intelligence there. There were clear signs of intelligence, but she couldn't connect it up. There was no way that she could learn how to read or to write or to spell. And of course, you don't get far in life if you can't do that. So her, her increasing depression just forced me to change my direction. Now, in my previous businesses, I'm, an, I'm a kind of disruptive innovator. So I go into industries, and because I'm not educated, I don't know what I shouldn't do. So I look for logically where's the best solutions. And of course, when she presented me with this huge challenge, I sold my businesses and focused all of my time, money, energy onto finding solutions for her. And the journey since then has been huge. I, you know, I've met amazing people like you and Jeremy Schwarman at Harvard and Rod Nicholson, the professor at Edge Hill, some amazing people. And I keep on learning things as I've learned from the amazing data you've got. I keep on learning ways of making this program more and more and more and more effective, especially for children. But for all So ages. you have a daughter that has learning problems, that's depressed, that tries to kill herself. And to tell us the road from that to the cerebellum and what you're doing today. So I want to know how you connected those dots. Well, I, I was looking at, uh, at any methodology that was impacting the ability to read. I presume that was the top of the, of the pile for her was the fact that she couldn't read. That must be the root cause of everything. So I focused on that and I, I, I found some research linking the role of the cerebellum with the skill development that enables reading. I found a professor in England, uh, Professor Rod Nicholson, who was specializing in this. He was, he was following work done by Jeremy Schwarman, the professor at, at Harvard at Mass General Hospital. Uh, and it was unbelievably unpopular, this stuff. People were ridiculing what was being said about the cerebellum. 
Oh, Rodney Dangerfield, part yeah. of the brain. Right? It's just exactly. no, no, ridiculous. It's... And, you know, one of the reasons I got involved in the cerebellum is on SPAC, the study we do yeah. here at Amon Clinics, the cerebellum is the most active yeah. part of the brain in a healthy scan. And that just makes complete sense because if yeah. it has 50% of the brain's neurons, yeah. odds are they're go it's going to be the most active yeah. part of the brain. And when it's not, it's a sign of trouble. Yeah. And so through being concerned about reading and dyslexia, you came upon the cerebellum with these wonderful professors and, and then optimizing the cerebellum. Well, it was trial and error. You know, I, 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 my type of research is I'm fascinated with data, absolutely obsessed with data, and I had to keep my daughter alive. There wasn't time to do double-blind peer-reviewed studies and wait for another 10. I was desperately hoping I wasn't going to get another phone call saying that she'd attempted to take her life again. So you can imagine my f obsessive focus. I got assembled a huge team of people, and we were just desperately trying everything. And everything that worked, we did more of, and that that wasn't working, we did less of. So it was a... A trial. So what were the things that, and what's her name? Her name is Susie. Susie. So, so what were the things that worked for Susie? Well, we've quickly found that the more vestibular, that's inner ear, balance organ stimulation we gave, activated her cerebellum and things started to improve. And it, you know, as soon as I started this, just talking to friends, I realized you know, maybe one in five children are underachieving in school. And so we quickly I had- I think it's 20% of kids have dyslexia. We quickly had an army of mums who wanted their children to try this mad stuff in case it helped. So we quickly had these all these guinea pigs, I cruelly call them, that were trying these exercises and we were getting, within months, we were getting amazing results. And so it comes down to activating the cerebellum, which is heavily involved with motor coordination, and activating the vestibular system which is involved in balance the vest what it what seems to be happening is the vestibular system is crucial in the timing or the powering of of neurological development so the the, the vestibular system has huge links everywhere in the brain to the emotional parts to the learning parts to the cerebellum as well as of course to the rest of the body where it coordinates and fine tunes all of our movements. So by stimulating that, you're kind of readying the brain for change and development. By stimulating the cerebellum, the cerebellum acts like the electricians that wire up the brain and make things automatic. So in Susie's case, the first big issue we were focusing on was her reading abilities. And we realized actually her eye tracking was poor, very poor. And in the studies we've done since, we realize that over 90% of children that struggle with reading, they don't have a problem with underintelligence at all. What they have a problem with is eye tracking. In actual fact, they're often brighter than average when you get down to it. But without that skill developed, reading is impossible for them. And how did you help their eye tracking? Or how did you help Susie's? I mean, I want to I want to hear the rest of Susie's <laughs> story. As Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. Su Su Susie, Susie, within within a few months was reading. Now she'd been taught at this point almost twenty years earlier, and the teachers thought that everything they tried to teach her hadn't gone in. They thought it was three steps forward and three back, but it wasn't because the cerebellum actually stores in what's called the internal model and the inverse model, all of those attempts to learn a skill, even if it can't finish off the skill so that you can use it. So one of the reasons we we had this accidental discovery that, that we were transforming kids and adults that couldn't read is that the brain had actually got the ability there, but it was not finished off. And by stimulating the vestibular, which in turn readied the cerebellum, we ended up creating these hardwired programs that gave them the skills that made life-changing difference to them. And so with Susie, what were the exercises you used? And I know you've evolved a lot since then, but early on, what were the things you'd have Susie do? So a, a lot of the exercises we give, uh, and they vary in intensity, they're all custom made for each individual, but they're all exercises that involve some form of balance and some form of coordination. Now, the inner ear, the balance organ, is what's stimulated when you jump up and down, when you go from side to side, when you go round and round. 
all of those things stimulate the vestibular and the inner the little hairs inside the the the, the vestibular system tell the brain you're moving and how far you're moving and where you are in space and so on by stimulating that it's kind of exciting the whole brain and if you then carry out some specific coordination activity and it can be throwing a bean bag back and forth or standing on one leg and spinning around and putting your head on one side and closing your eyes all of these different types of exercise are actually creating increased density of gray matter increased brain cells in the cerebellum in that electrician that hardwires the rest of the brain. So Susie was our very first guinea pig, and she did it with lots of others, folk who became her friends. And within months, these exercises were causing fundamental increases in the ability to learn, learn incredibly important skills. <laughs> this blows me away, right? Because traditional psychiatry mm. would take someone like Susie and start to drug her brain yeah. into submission. Mm. And yet you are so outside of the box, right? <laughs> right out of the pill box. And you're using balance and coordination exercises to stimulate a part of her brain that actually can turn on the rest of the brain. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the, one of the most interesting terms I've learned um, is called cross cerebellar diaschesis. And people yeah. go, what? You know, yeah. it's like, what is that? Um, so if we just break it down, crossed means if you hurt the left front side of yeah. your brain, it actually turns off the right cerebellum. Yeah. So there's these tracks yeah. in your brain that yeah. cross from one side to the other. Yeah. Cerebellum, obviously, is the cerebellar, uh, the cerebellum diaschesis means low blood flow. Yeah. So if you hurt the left front side of your brain and there's low blood flow for whatever reason, a stroke, trauma, um, toxins even, it'll actually turn off the yeah. opposite side yeah. cerebellum. And one of the most interesting things I've learned about the cerebellum is the, so the cerebellum has two hemispheres. Yeah. So two sides, just like you have a left hemisphere of your brain and a right hemisphere of your brain where you have the left hemisphere of your cerebellum and the right hemisphere the right hemisphere of the cerebellum actually controls left hemisphere functions yeah. and so if you hurt the right yeah. cerebellum you know well what are left hemisphere functions it's detail it's timing it's language um where if you hurt the left cerebellum it affects what looks like it looks like you hurt yeah. the right side of the brain which is spatial processing creativity mm -hmm. um social skills interactions sort of putting um the big picture mm -hmm. together and i just thought wow that is just so interesting it, it is exciting and look it, it was an accidental discovery it was a discovery driven by... most great discoveries are but someone's just paying attention well, it was driven by my desperate need to solve the problem for my daughter that the experts we'd taken her to couldn't tackle. Well, she's alive today and she's very happy. And of course, I'm thrilled with that. And so in the next podcast, I want to talk about some of the stories oh. that have come out of your work. Oh, yeah. Um, Winford has a new book out, Stop Struggling in School. You can get it on Amazon and it will basically tell you the story of yeah. how he yeah. developed this. And you can take advantage of uh, his work uh, and the program he's developed for optimizing performance as well, in, as well as helping kids and adults who struggled in school by going to your website. Yeah. Tell people the website. Yeah, it's, it's www.withzing.com. That's with Zing. Z-I-N-G dot com. And it'll give you lots of information there. And there's some, there's some assessments you can do. So you can actually find out, is the symptoms my child or myself my, as an adult is suffering from are caused by incomplete development of the cerebellum? You know, this is such a misunderstood area. I want to just give hope to people. Well, in the studies we've published on autism and ADD and traumatic yeah. brain injury, all have cerebellar components yeah. Yeah. to them. And so now to have a direct way to optimize the cerebellum, it 
may be helpful yeah. to you. So yeah. with W-I-T-H, Zing, Z-I-N-G, with Zing.com, uh, check it out. Stay with us. You're listening to The Brain Warrior's Way. So welcome back. Uh, we're here with Winford Dorr. We're talking about the cerebellum. Welcome again to Cerebellar Week, uh, to the Rodney Dangerfield part of the brain <laughs> that people just don't care about. Uh, and it's interesting. When I first started imaging the brain, it was actually 1988, and I learned about nerve feedback. Yeah. And nerve feedback is a tool where we put electrodes on yeah. the scalp and show people their brainwave activity and then teach them to change it. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I learned about quantitative EEG and I really liked that. It was mm -hmm. a new way to look at the brain. Mm -hmm. But EEG doesn't look at all at the cerebellum. Sure. And when we started doing spec scans in 1991, now it's giving this really great view of the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. And the medicine we use, Ceratec, to do the scans at Amen Clinics, it lights up the cerebellum. Yeah. So it's the best imaging study if you want to look at the cerebellum. And we just saw so many yeah. problems that yeah. could be fixed. Yeah. I mean, that was the exciting thing. I yeah. showed you a case earlier. Yeah. Winford and I were hanging out today. Uh, I showed you a case of a woman who'd been diagnosed with ADD by six different doctors, had her on six different stimulants. I'm thinking somebody's got a learning problem, talking mm -hmm. about learning problems. Um, you know, after three, you think, okay, this isn't mm -hmm. the right thing. Mm -hmm. And when she came to see me, she had a cerebellar tumor. And her whole brain was low in blood flow mm -hmm. because the tumor had disrupted mm -hmm. her cerebellum and the mm -hmm. cerebellum then disrupted yeah. the rest of her brain. And when they took out the tumor, her ADD went away. Yeah. I mean, it was really stunning yeah. how helpful that was. So, you know, so the cerebellum is just so important. So as you come to this finding to help your daughter, so how is she now? She, she is fine. In fact, she's still making great progress. You know, she, she went through a period of a few months where she was able to start reading. And that was kind of foundational and, and writing. Then she started being able to communicate with other people because her confidence was going up. Because one of the things we see is that, that very often those who are struggling with learning have low levels of self-esteem. And not many people realize that there's a direct link between your ability to automatize skill and how you feel about yourself. So whilst we were focusing initially on Susie's reading issues, we suddenly realized that this cerebellum or the brain within the brain, as some call it, was, was actually impacting so many of the other symptoms that we didn't realize were connected. So her mood swings, her depression, her writing ability, her reading ability, her ability to be organized and be structured was all impacted by the cerebellum. So when we started stimulating that and developing that, Susie became more of a natural, more confident, more outgoing person. The cerebellum, you actually call it in your book, the brain's brain. I do, yeah. Which I think is, is well, it's fascinating. A bit, it's, it's like the electrician that sits at the back here and just hardwires everything up. And, and you know, fortunately, it is very, very few that have cerebellar tumors. That's very rare. Very rare. But one in five will have their cerebellum underdeveloped, and it will show us poor attention, poor reading, poor writing, poor organization, and so on. So the, all of these other symptoms can be attributed back to incomplete development of the cerebellum. And that's what's so exciting is that I want to stop people thinking that if you've got a child or if you're an adult and struggling with these symptoms, that it's because of low levels of intelligence. It's often the opposite. And mums, you know, those warrior mums that are out there, they often see this intelligence in the child and they, find, they think, why isn't the school finding this? You know, we expect the education system or the medical system to be proactive at resolving these issues, and they aren't. They struggle, and they 
children struggle and adults struggle and often they go right through life without this being found. So, so how does the hope. cerebellum develop? I live next door to a farm and every spring I go there and I watch some lambs being born and start running. You know, they're within minutes of being born. They're feeding, they're standing up and the next day they're out in the field and they're running around and jumping. Their cerebellum is highly developed from birth, whereas in humans, it's not. It's almost completely undeveloped. And so what takes a lamb a day will take a human two years to get the same level of ability to jump around and so on. So it's no wonder that different aspects of the development of the cerebellum is going to vary in the speed with which it develops. So when I see a child or an adult that's struggling with incomplete development of the cerebellum, I only think of it as a delay, and actually I think of it as a positive. So I don't tend to use the labels dyslexia and autism anymore because I see huge potential. So I, I just see that there's been a delay for some reason, whatever it is, just do the right things and you can continue that development, and often with unbelievably exciting results, as I saw in my own daughter. So crawling helps to oh, I did not stimulate the cerebellum. Yes. So what a child is doing those early months of its life is naturally doing the vestibular type stimulation and coordination activities that develops the cerebellum. So often you find that children that manifest at five, six, seven years of age struggles with, say, reading or other learning issues. Often you can identify that they have bypassed a specific exercise that they should have been doing. So you know, my this is a tragic admission on my own part. My oldest daughter, Susie, we put her in a baby walker. So she didn't do much crawling and she struggled. Now, that may have been a coincidence, but I do know when I talk to parents, so many of the children that struggle with fundamental learning issues actually bypassed some of the crawling phase. Or conversely, sometimes they crawled for far too long and they were delayed in walking, delayed in speaking and so on. So it's what's happening those early months appears to be driving the development of the cerebellum in a natural and a complete way. And if you bypass it, you can do and you've got to go back at the later stage in life and complete that development so that this brain within the brain can do its job. So you just gave me a horrifying idea. Oh, good. That when Elias was born, he's my eight-year-old grandson who I adore, um, and his parents, who I love dearly, you know, they'd give him the cell phone and he mm. was mm. completely addicted to this thing. Mm. And so we've just known not to give him mm. a gadget. Mm. Um, but early on, um, so many kids now are either in front yeah. of the television, yeah. in front of the yeah. iPad, in front of the computer, yeah. in front of the smartphone. We should call these dumb phones. Mm. Um, and so they're not getting Mm. The same level Absolutely. of physical exercise. Absolutely. Uh, they're not getting the same. They're getting a different level of cerebellar activation than if they're exactly doing exercise. Absolutely. Um, you know, not thumb exercise. There's actually a study that says the thumb representation in the brain has become larger since we've yeah. introduced gadgets. Yeah. And, you know, who needs a larger thumb representation? Well, a monkey, if you're in a tree, yeah. not humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I wonder, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is the introduction of gadgets in mm. the Middle Ages, uh, does that in some way correlate with the skyrocketing number of kids who have ADD and learning problems um, because they're not getting the physical mm. cerebellar development. You know, I never really thought about that until just this moment. Mm. Talking to you is, um, what do you think? I think that there's, there's always a propensity for there to be some learning issue, and the greater the propensity, the more likely it is to happen. But then nurture comes into it, and if you do give a child an excuse to be sedentary and not stimulate the vestibula for long periods, then you're not giving the cerebellum a chance. And so- How interesting. So exercise at every age yeah. is critical to brain development. And mm. we, we've just seen that. It's sort of the universal treatment 
for depression. Head to head yeah. against antidepressants, they're equally effective. Yeah. For attention all problems. Yeah. Well, what all, all we've done, uh, Dr. Raymond, is to systematically create the right exercise, the right level of stimulation into a program so that we can take people from wherever they are to a higher level of development of the cerebellum. So I'm a huge, huge fan of exercise. And in fact, the American government did a wonderful report a few years ago for schools saying, giving all sorts of examples of proven research showing how exercise transforms kids. What happens in schools? They took exercise out of schools to save money. It's like they took music out of schools when I was growing up, probably yeah. you too. Mm -hmm. The music was just sort of part yeah. of the curriculum, yeah. and now it's it's not anymore. Yeah. So I want to, in this podcast, I want to talk about some stories. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you think back on all the people that have done mm -hmm. your program, are there a couple of stories mm -hmm. that stand out? There, there is so many. Um, the, the, the first one that comes to mind I'll tell you about is, a, is a, a guy called Jim. He was in his 40s and he'd been severely autistic. He just followed his parents around uh, very, very quietly, wouldn't speak to anybody. They had to wash him, feed him, dress him and so on. And they were in their 70s and he, they were afraid to get old. And they worked with him. Normally it takes us six to 12 months. In their case, it took a couple of years. But at the end of two years... Jim was going off to London on his own to see his sister, and he was at college studying to be a chef. And the, the, the parents came to me one day and they said, you know what, we're no longer worried about getting old. Wow. Because we know that Jim can look after himself. And that was, I was just in floods of tears. So the impact, impact poor learning has on people is huge. And the impact of... And their families. Oh. The worry that... I have a handicapped granddaughter, right. uh, Emmy, who I think our followers know about. She was born with a genetic microdeletion syndrome. Mm -hmm. And when she was five months old, she had mm -hmm. um, wicked seizures. One day she oh, had 160 my. of them. Wow. And they said she wouldn't walk and... On the ketogenic diet, she just did so well. Really? And, but she still has developmental delays. Mm. And when I scanned her at nine months old, yeah. she just had nothing going on in her cerebell. Mm. So I'm going to see if I can get her mom to do this oh, program. Oh, wonderful. I think it could be helpful for her. Um, well, we, we, the second story that comes to mind is one actually in, in Australia, one in our Sydney clinic. And it was a girl that had uh, severe um, cerebellar hyperplasia. And she, it, it took them a couple of years. And I've, I still keep the videos and occasionally look at them where she's went from not just going around in a, in a frame. Now she, she can actually run and function. And it is thrilling. That brings tears to my eyes as well. I cry easily because, you know, having watched my own daughter wanting to die, it makes you realize the pain that individuals and families face. Oh, it's, it's just devastating. It, it um, reminds me of this story of a kid I saw. So I was at a, a cocktail party mm. and, you know, our group knows I don't drink. So I was having sparkling water mm. and just talking to these very nice people and all of a sudden they realized who I was and they told me about their son who didn't get pancakes in the morning mm. and he had to have his way or he got really upset and he chased his mother around the house for 40 minutes with the butcher knife. And I'm like, oh my God. I said, you should bring him to see me. And so mm. they brought Alex to see me. And um, when he was three, he had a cerebellar tumor. Wow. And so I know this is my second tumor story. Yeah, yeah. They had a cerebellar tumor. They took it out, mm. but they didn't get it all. So they had to go back mm. in. And on the second time when they back in, he developed meningitis. Wow. And the meningitis just killed his left temporal lobe. Mm. Your temporal lobe's underneath your temples and behind your eyes. And he developed wicked seizures. Mm. And in many ways, people who have autistic kids can relate to it. Yeah. The kid doesn't get his way and get very aggressive. And um, and when I scanned him, I could see the cerebellar, cerebellum missing. Mm. His left mm. temporal lobe was clearly damaged. That's mm. where the seizures mm. came from. 
but is anterior cingulate gyrus. Um, it's your gear shifter in the front part of your brain was freaking on fire. I mean, wow. it just looked like it had seizure activity. Yeah. It was so yeah. active. And when I calm down his cingulate, I use Lexapro to do that, um, increases anticonvulsant. He did so much better. Wow. But now that I know about your yeah. program, I'm like, well, that, yeah. you know, his cerebellum was clearly damaged yeah. from this tumor from the surgery that to reprogram it, should have been yeah. part of his rehabilitation program. And that's yeah. why I was so excited to spend time with you, because well, I've just seen the cerebellum to be so troubled. Yeah. And nobody cares about it, which is It's the poor bizarre. relation. It is. And the professor who put this on the map was Jeremy Schmarman at Harvard Medical School many years ago. It took him years to get his first papers published. And that's the scary thing about research. Very often it takes generations before it reaches those that need it. And that's scary. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, board member of the REACH Institute in New York. And the whole point of that is so that cutting edge research doesn't get left for two or three generations before it reaches the people that, that need it. So I, I, can I just share with you one more story? And it's, it's a very personal one. It's my, my, I met my soulmate, Ninka Moritz, and she's from Denmark just uh, two and a half years ago. Her oldest son, uh, he'd been thrown out of, sorry, her youngest son, he'd been thrown out of five schools in Denmark. And when I met him, I could see a bright guy that had learned nothing, huge maths anxiety, and he just didn't know anything about science and so on, but clearly had got intellect. Well, to cut a long story short, he's actually at, at the school I own in England right now, but the most important thing that happened is that he did the Zing program. And all of the reasons he was misunderstood all of his inability to learn has been transformed. He'd got a perfect brain waiting for the cerebellum to be wired up so that his learning circuits were activated. He's caught up in two years. He's doing in what in England is called the GCSE exams right now, and they're predicting he's going to pass a lot of them. Well, and I've talked to his mother, and she is just a raving fan <laughs> uh, of your work. So stay with us. Yeah. We're in the middle of Cerebellum Week. When yeah. we come back, we're going to talk about how you can activate your cerebellum, your vestibular system to have the best overall brain yeah. possible. Stay with us. I will embrace my many strengths. I will not be tormented by my past. I will find the right balance. I will be calm and courageous. I will be free. I am not just bipolar. I am not just autism. I'm not just depression. I'm not just ADD. I am not just I am not just OCD. I am not just PTSD. So welcome back. So this is our last episode of Cerebellum Week. I am here with Winford Dorr. Uh, he is the author of Stop Struggling in School, um, also the creator of the Zing program, www.withzing.com. Uh, I have been fascinated by his work and uh, we're beginning to do some research together here at Amon Clinics. And... Um, We've talked about some sort of severe cases, yeah. like Susie mm -hmm. and Nina's son. Um, but I also believe that if you want to optimize your mm -hmm. performance, the first thing to do is optimize your cerebellum. Absolutely. The cerebellum is the key. I mean, why not go with 50% of the brain to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the cerebellum is so misunderstood. 
but so are the people who have an incompletely developed cerebellum so misunderstood. So the vast majority of children that I see struggling in school, as my book talks about, is children that I don't don't read very much. They can't concentrate for long, and teachers often wrongly assume they're choosing not to be concentrating, or they're assuming that no, they're not to, intelligent. We have to stop with that because it's so important. So many people, when a child struggles or an adult struggles, they think they know why, yeah. and they label them yes. as bad yeah. or unmotivated yeah. or don't care. Yeah. I cannot tell you the thousands of people who come yeah. to the clinic, and I go, well, what did your teacher say about you? If only you tried harder, you'd do better. Yeah. And in fact, what we've seen with the images yeah. uh, is the harder many people try, the worse it gets. I just saw a girl yesterday who's a world-famous person who, when she tried to concentrate, her cerebellum yeah. deactivated, along yeah. with her frontal lobe deactivated. Yeah. And there is no amount of shaming yeah. There's no amount of belittling her. There's no amount of smacking her because she'd been fairly severely abused. There is no amount of that that is going to help her mm -hmm. that we need to look. I mean, that's yeah. what we do. Is We need to look and then we need to rehabilitate. Yeah, absolutely. So if you've got a child that's misunderstood, have a look at the cerebellum and find out if any aspect of the cerebellum is not yet developed because that will probably explain it. And the irony is, very often, the brighter the, the fundamental part of the brain is, the less developed the cerebellum is. So you often get these, uh, these strange situations where you've got um, savants and highly autistic people who are genius at something but totally incapable of others, a complete eccentricity. Asperger's the same. You get and that's what we see. It's a classic autism pattern on scans. They're mm. hyperfrontal, which means their frontal yeah. lobes work too hard and their cerebellums are cold. Well, They're I, just low in activity. I, I'm actually sitting here. I've, I've been with Dr. Eamon this morning, and I can hardly sit down because I'm so excited about the quality of the data. I believe that the, 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 the brain scan methods that you are using could transform the effectiveness of psychiatric conditions and all sorts of learning things too. I know what I'm doing is already extremely good, but I know you're going to help me make it hugely better. And that so excites me. There's so, you know, one in five children are struggling, misunderstood, underperforming, and the chances are they might go right through life underperforming. One in a hundred will become a millionaire and do something even though they drop out of school, as nearly all the billionaires have done. Why is that? Why is our education system not understanding that? Yeah, education because is... Because it's a brainless education yeah. system. What if we educated people to optimize their brain? Um, you know, what a concept. But uh, So if someone's intrigued, they can get your book, Stop yep. Struggling in School. They can go to withzing.com. Uh, get, get a copy for the teacher as well. Because often it's the teacher that's holding the child back because the teacher doesn't understand. So what are some of the practical things our listeners can do to optimize their vestibular systems and their cerebellums? Because um, if you are struggling or you just want to be your best, because I know a lot of professional athletes use this program. Oh, yeah, they do. Uh, mm -hmm. But l let's give people... Just things to think about. I often talk about on the Brain Warriors way that I play table tennis actually yep. at a really high level mm. and because I think of it as one of the best brain games. Absolutely. you got to get your eyes, your hands, and feet all to work together while you think about the spin on the ball and it's a strategy yeah. game. And you're right. Table tennis is great for that because you've got a lot of vestibular stimulation, a lot of eye movement, a lot of coordination happening all at the same time. That's great. Brain training games, however, on the other hand, you're staring at the computer, you might be moving the mouse a bit, no vestibular stimulation. They will not create any significant lasting change in the brain. In fact, the potential is that they will actually stifle further development. You know, I've got a grandson and I'm pestering him all the time to reduce the, the screen time he spends. Get him outside, get the kids outside, get them climbing and jumping and doing all of the things that, that will stimulate their vestibular. So increased exercise, physical exercise As is long critical. as it doesn't increase the risk for concussions. Oh, yeah. So we're not hitting soccer balls with our head, right? We're not playing tackle football. We need to protect the brain. And if you did, like I did, um, you, you need to rehabilitate your brain. 
Yeah. So, uh, so I have a huge, um, and you said something interesting this morning that the trampoline yeah. can actually be really good as long as I don't get a concussion being crazy on the trampoline. Trampolining is, is great, be safe with it. So is things like ballet. So anything where there's significant amounts of balance. Now, the irony is that things like skiing and surf, windsurfing and so on, these are actually very good exercises, but it doesn't activate the whole of the cerebellum. It's very good for some aspects of of vestibular, that's balance, stimulation, but it doesn't do them all. So don't expect any of these sports to do everything. And that's why I put together a, a comprehensive program that systematically goes through every different type of vestibular stimulation and every different type of important coordination and put them together in a systematized way. But every exercise you get your child to do will make a difference. So I wonder if you know about this study from, uh, I think it was from England, where they looked at 90,000 people. Yeah. And they looked at who did what exercise and how long did you live. Ah. And so people who lived the shortest was soccer and football, American mm -hmm. football. Yeah. Peep, um, runners, it actually didn't extend their life. It was pretty interesting. Um, that people, swimmers, extended their life, mm. but people who played racket sports lived the longest. Wow. And I think of all of those, racket sports yeah. actually activate the cerebellum yeah, yeah. Um, almost more than anything else. Um, but what do you think about running and activating the cerebellum? You know, my, my thought is, but I'd love your thought, is... Well, not much because it's sort of automatic. It's completely where... automatic. And, and you're, gen you're generally going in pretty much a straight line. So there's actually relatively low levels of vestibular stimulation in that. With, with, with table tennis, you are jumping around from side to side and going back and forward. You're giving every type of stimulation possible every split second to your cerebellum. Running is, is yeah, it's good maybe for your cardio and so on. But in terms of vestibular stimulation, it's not going to do much. And so walking wouldn't really do very much for vestibular no, stimulation. No, walking's not, and then unless you're doing an obstacle course, pool or and like things that. like that, they're fun, but they're not going to they're not going to help your brain that much. Interesting. All right. So, what are some of the exercises people can do for vestibular stimulation? Well, if you got uh, if you look on if you actually look in my book, we actually give a load of free exercises away, things you can do, and they're things like getting your child to balance on one leg and then shutting one eye. Be careful when you do that so they don't hurt themselves. Because the more you the more you can stand on one leg and then shut your eye. Yeah, try it, Dr. Amon is. Oh, so now I'm out of the thing. Now when I shut both eyes, it begins to wobble. Yeah. There's actually um, how long you can keep your eyes closed on one leg determines your brain's age. Exactly. Well, you can bring your brain so age I used to down. practice one leg. Yeah. How long can I stand? Yeah, you can actually bring your brain's age down. So if your child is, say, 10 years of age and can only stand on one leg with his or her eyes closed for about 10 seconds, if they can only do that, then they've got some more development. They've got some more potential you're waiting to discover. So that's a kind of general rule of thumb. So standing on one leg is great. Getting them to spin around is is another thing. Getting them to jump on one leg and spin in a jump around in a circle, and then get them to shut one eye whilst they do that. Or any exercise that involves jumping, spinning, standing on one leg, especially with your eyes closed, all of those are going to force the vestibular to be exercised, which in turn forces this electrician at the back here, the cerebellum, to do some more fundamental wiring. Do you think that's why autistic kids tend to flap or spin as an attempt to try to s stimulate that system? Well, it's interesting. I, I think there's some inhibition things going on there as well, which is a slightly different issue. So they've got reduced control of, of, of to stop things happening. But many autistic children come alive if you take them to a fun fair. If they go round and round or going up and down, they're smiling. They're often, not always, but they're often at their happiest when they've got huge amounts of vestibular stimulation. Or if you take a young child that's autistic 
into a swimming pool and you throw them up and down in the water, they love it. So you get more happiness, more joy when the vestibular is stimulated, the cerebellum is doing its job and their whole brain comes alive and it's functioning more normally. And the people who would benefit from Zing, um, there's so many kids and Chloe, my 14 year old who I adore when I scanned her, mm -hmm. very busy frontal lobes, mm -hmm. very quiet cerebellum and she's not in any and way huge autistic. potential then huge potential not in any way autistic mm. but um knowing that is we knew why she would quit when she started a sport yeah. if she wasn't perfect so mm. this hyperfrontal often goes with yeah, perfectionism yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which she clearly has and so when she saw it she's like okay i understand why i have mm. to do coordination exercises and dance yeah. made a huge yeah, positive difference yeah. for her i am trying to get her to do zing so it's well children it, do not always listen to their parents no and it's it's not <laughs> it's not as easy as taking a pill but it develops naturally and in a lasting way the kind of thing that's going to make a, a lifelong difference. So if you think like when you, run, when you learn to ride a bike, you don't do it in a second. You m might know what to do because you've watched people riding a bike. But until you've practiced and practiced and practiced, you can't ride. You fall off. When finally the cerebellum has done its job and made all of those coordinative links, you can get on a bike without thinking about it and ride automatically. Oh, so many kids who are anxious about riding a bike or learning yeah. how to swim often have an underdeveloped cerebellum yeah. and if you go through the program and um, the program is 10 minutes twice a day and often after a month people notice significant benefit they do and but you recommend they do it for about six months yeah it look it's, it's not a it's not a quick thing it's 10 minutes twice a day for six months but if you've got a child struggling at school if you've got a child that's got potential and no one is finding it do you really want them to go right through their life without discovering it? You know, I, the, I right. I mean, six months is like a drop in the bucket. For uh, absolutely. People. And you know, one of the interesting things I know that your partner is also very interested in diet. Absolutely. And nutrition. There's yeah. studies on gluten yeah. turning off the cerebellum. Yeah. Uh, there's ah. actually a spec study with gluten turning off the cerebellum. Wow. And in another study. 40% of people with cerebellar dyspraxia, so that's yeah. where the cerebellum's not working, yeah. um, is from a gluten sensitivity. Wow. And that's why so many of our autistic and ADD kids do better when we get rid of gluten and dairy. Mm. Uh, so, well, thank you so much for being part of Cerebellar Week uh, here on the Brain Warriors Way podcast. I want everyone to look at, you can get it on Amazon right now, Stop Struggling in School, go to withzing.com uh, to learn about it. Stay tuned here, we'll talk more about it as we get our research projects underway with Winfred Dorr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amonclinics.com or on our supplements at brainmdhealth.com. Thank you for listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Go to iTunes and leave a review and you'll automatically be entered into a drawing to get a free signed copy of the Brain Warriors Way and the Brain Warriors Way cookbook we give away every month.